the cats and elevators. Snakes. Oh, we'd let them too. But, you know, again, we come under some heavy duty regulations, of course, with, uh, with Florida, the state of Florida, about what you can and cannot do. So it really depends on, you know, the day and what we've got going on, but you can find just an incredible array of, of species coming through our doors. And of course, they're bringing so many different stories with them. And so I want to share some of those stories with you as well. So first of all, so first of all, when you think about what do you do as a rehab center? Well, we have quite an extensive mission from rescue, and we do have one full-time ambulance driver who does go out and pick up things. And especially, we try and focus those resources on the picking up of animals that are dangerous for the public who may have little idea of how to handle something, or rabies vector. And sadly, rabies is quite a, a normal feature of our mammalian wildlife in this region, as in many other regions. So having that, um, having that resource makes a, he a heck of a difference, and also is a it meets public health needs in some ways as well. Thankfully, we're also starting to work more closely with the local animal control officers, and they also are going to be picking up, um, especially around foods, but also other species. We also do rehabilitation, and that means basically we try and either make sure you grow up healthy and fit and good corporate citizens to get back out on with your lives, or we try and fix what has ever gone wrong. I would suggest that probably 98% of all of the animals coming through our doors, the problem lies directly with something we have done either directly to that animal or to the environment. It means that it is now in jeopardy. So that's what brings it into us. It's not that we go out there and pick up healthy animals, or these are animals that maybe are not going to make it through the year. These are animals that have really only come off second best because of us. And our goal is always to release. We don't offer sanctuary. We do try and place animals that we cannot fix. But as you can be, you can probably imagine, so many of our species come in so profoundly injured that the greatest gift we can often offer is is to release them, to euthanize them. And of course, one of the questions I ask when I'm often talking to my colleagues in rehabilitation is. How many of you got into this business to kill animals? You never see a hand go up. But that's our reality. And of course, the stress on us, because our whole motivation is often one of compassion and caring for our fellow travelers on this planet. And sadly, we often have to help them on their way. And then hopefully through education, not only for ourselves and Terminal, and that's one of the reasons that brought me down here, you might have realized that I didn't actually grow up here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Any Australians in the audience? Thank goodness, because I'm a New Zealander, okay? <laughs> and you can imagine there is a bit of rivalry between us, but we get over it. Thank goodness for beer and wine and whiskey. I mean, it passes everything, doesn't it? But we also have to think about education as being one of our primary goals. Because through education, we not only help ourselves, but we help everybody else out there, and ultimately the non-human components of our world, which are the wildlife that we passionately care about. So if you drive into our facility, the first thing you're going to come to is our resource center. And um, the hospital is that, that building. Um, you'll notice that most of the buildings are looking a little old. Well, this facility has been in existence for nearly 50 years, and on this site for about 40 years. The original building uh, was a house and has been massively converted into a hospital and uh, wards for our patients. But also we're living in trailers. And um, when Irma was coming along, I think we were all hoping she'd hit really hard. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Sadly, well, thank, I guess thankfully, we did lose a lot of trees, a lot of cover, and of course it buffeted all of the wooden structures. And at the moment, in fact, I know today they were having a meeting about the new facility. We're looking to build a new hospital. And I left some pamphlets out there, and if you'd like to join us, I can um, hand around a, or you can see me later, and sign up. We can keep you up to date with emails about our hope to build a brand new facility 
a new hospital to take care of things. So when you walk in, the first thing you're going to be greeted by is people on the phone. 75% of all human wildlife interactions actually can be resolved over the phone. And so we actually have this incredible team of people who sit there dealing with calls from, um, we cut the tree down and now we have a raccoon nest on the ground, what do we do? To, um, well some of the ones I really shouldn't mention. Holy cow, you get some real doozies coming in from that <laughs> phone line, you know, you really do. And they, they sit there and they listen and give really good solid advice. We also have um, a lot of flat down handouts and so I've also been trying to develop more and have them translated into Spanish because obviously we have a very large Hispanic community who are just as passionate also about the wildlife around them. So it's really exciting to share that. So we do have some wonderful pamphlets. They are available on the website as well. That's really exciting from my perspective as an educator. I would like everything to be made easy so that everybody can share the joy and the knowledge that we all share in our facility. The other thing you'll notice when you walk into our facility is there's going to be a board up and it'll tell you how many patients are on site right at the moment. Um, and often we, we're running between 10,000 and 12,000 cases coming in every year. It's you know quite a large operation. So we also can think of you know, the range of species that might be coming in the door, and up to 250 species are what we can expect to get, and often get in at least the uh, high hundreds, and uh, up to 200 species per year. And of course, many of those, not many of those, but a number of those are also species of concern. We know that we're losing ground, and very sadly, uh, the reports coming out now are telling us that so many of our species, many of our vertebrate species, are learning, losing ground. And so we certainly do see our number of endangered, uh, threatened or species of concern coming through our doors. So as I mentioned, uh, I think we have an ambulance service. Thank goodness. Because I, you know, just, I, I, my heart goes out to these animals. You know, if one of us gets knocked off on the road, or knocked off, like knocked over, shall we say, on the road. Knocked off is not quite what I meant to do. <laughs> but, um, you know, knocked over on the road, somebody is going to call a 911 and an ambulance is going to show up fairly rapidly along with everybody else and you'll be whisked off to hospital. Many of our patients actually sit on that road for hours to even days. And so they're coming in just in such poor condition. So when we can respond almost immediately to a case, I find, you know, I, I just am thankful that we can do so. Now, just like any triage or um, any uh, emergency clinic you go into, the first thing you've got to do is go through triage. Now, if you're not too badly hurt, you know, you've gone in because you feel a bit sick, um, you're probably going to sit in that waiting room, depending on how long the wait is, maybe for an hour or two or three or four if you're a human. Um, of course, if you're critical, you get in pretty quickly. For us, if you are critical, you get seen very quickly uh, because often you're bleeding, you're having trouble breathing, whatever. That will be an immediate response. But sometimes it's also valuable to let that animal who's just gone through hell just to sit in a quiet area, protected, and just catch their breath. And so we can often reduce a lot of stress before we start the next stages of this process just by letting them have a half an hour just to catch their breath because they've already gone through hell and now they're going to be put through a little bit more because they're being handled by a predator. We're predators and they know it. Our eyes are in the front of our face and you can't fake that. They know it, you know. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how nice we try to be. So, you know, that little bit of time to catch your breath. So remember the next time you may be sitting in the emergency room, you're just catching your breath, okay? <laughs> Through a threaded sheet. <laughs> uh, once you get in, you're going to be examined. We have three veterinarians on staff. We also have a number of veterinary technicians and highly skilled rehabilitators as well. So depending on the workload, you may have two lines running where our patients are being examined. And the decisions are being made. Is this an animal that has a future? And what is that future? So we also have to make some of those life and death decisions right immediately. If you've got you know, guts hanging out, we can see a part of your brain, 
there's wings missing, things like that. We cannot really fix that. And we can't offer a life that is suited to you, the spirit that is you. So we, we offer you know very gentle, kind way of going out. But of course, once you've got those initial exams done, we've made decisions about, yes, we can fix this. The question is, what are we going to do? And that animal might have been sitting out on that hut road. I found out that South Florida is a hot place. I am not suited to it, but I take my hat off to anybody who is, and I, I, I'm really grateful for AC. But these animals don't have that luxury. They've sat out there often in the hot sun without food and water for hours to days. And so often our first step is just to start stabilizing, and that means fluids. So we, we put the plans in place. How are we going to go and move through the steps to actually have give us an um, animal the best opportunity to recover? And uh, you know, often takes uh, it does. It takes quite a team of people because you can imagine with our caseload, even if we have you know uh, in the normal height of summer, we might have probably six or eight hundred animals on site. That's a lot of animals all needing care of some sort just to be you know be present for. Uh, the other thing we need to do is really make sure and reevaluate constantly all of those cases. We need to know that you're moving through the healing process, that you're stabilizing. And of course, we see some pretty cool animals through that process. Uh, we also see some extremely sad cases. And I'm going to see if I can point. Okay, so in this x ray, this is a red tailed hawk that has three separate forms of ballistic material on board. It means it has been shot three separate times. Look at this. These are the round ones. This is probably steel shot. So somebody with a, you know, a, a gauge um, shotgun took a shot at it. This is a air rifle pellet. Some kid, and I hate to say it, but probably a teenage boy. We know that that is, you know, the, the biggest part of the general uh, the uh, um, population who plays with these guns has taken a shot at it. And down here, this deformed area, that is probably lead, lead deforms. And so we have three separate incidents that this red tail boy was shot at. And sadly, that's what we see all too often. Um, I was so delighted to see your x-ray facility. I think having that to be able to diagnose and, and really get a handle on what's going on is so crucial. And we do also have a very good x-ray unit at our facility as well. It is used constantly. That uh, be it. Hmm? Sorry? That be it. No, she didn't. And that's the, that's the sadness of it for us too, because we, we don't want to face the, those things. These are magnificent animals who were living free and wild until some crazy person came along and did something unconscionable. And highly legal, not to mention, you know, not, not to forget to mention. Um, we also do um, orthopedic surgeries on many of our patients as well. And of course, much of this technology has come from the human field. So it's really good to have a foot or a, a doorway open into the you know, being able to read human literature or keep up with the new developments in orthopedics. And so you can maybe see we have a fracture here, and this is the equivalent of the hand of a bird. So we've got pins stabilizing each side, and then externally, we have an external fixator here. And it's one of these little plastic tubey things that you put along the outside and then you shoot in a goop which is hot for a bit and then it hardens and becomes really solid and provides a lot of stability to that uh, site. So we've got a lot of these things. This is what you would use, obviously, in our cats and dogs as well with fractures, but also in us. You know, external fixators are a normal standard orthopedic surgery uh, process. And of course, then you have to wait it out and wait for them to heal. Thankfully, birds, for instance, heal awfully quickly. So, you know, a little songbird or warbler with a fracture, that fracture is going to have a stable palace probably within about six, seven days, and it's going to be just fine. Even in by day two or three, you can see stability happening. By the time you get up to, say, a fish crow, 
you're probably looking at about two weeks. And with these herons, by about week three, you're looking at a very stabilized fracture. But thankfully, they heal fast, unlike some of our other patients. And I'll talk about those a bit later on. Um, obviously, one of the other biggies that we have down here are fishing tackle. And this pelican is having a uh, surgery to actually remove a hook. But I'm going to show you a pretty exciting piece of footage later on. We can actually, right, we, we make our staff members with the smallest hands do it, but you can actually reach down into a pelican's belly and pull it out. Um, so we can do that as well. We also learn a lot from your human tech and your orthopedics and also um, physiotherapy. So we use cold laser to help reduce pain and to promote healing. Fabulous unit, and it's just making such a difference to so many of our patients. So we use a lot of different modalities in our practice. We just pirate everything from everyone. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you've come in, you've been in terrible shape, you probably are going to spend a few days in our intensive care. And so that's where we really monitor the cases. They're often on intravenous fluids and also on oxygen supplementation. If you have a head injury, you can imagine how many of our cases come in with head injuries. They've been banged into, they banged into something. Or even if you're a heron, you've been flying along, you've been clipped at the back head. Guess what your head does? Whoops around and whacks on the head, on the car, doesn't it? So we know from human studies, by adding oxygen to the mix, we can actually reduce the amount of damage done to the cells in the brain. So, you go on oxygen supplementation. Guess what you guys would be doing in hospital? You'd be getting tubes up your noses or a full mask and having the same treatment. And it works. Now, once you've moved out of intensive care, the next step for you might be going into the ward. You're still on medications. We're still making sure you're stable and eating and pooping. Uh, what goes in one end needs to come out the other. We need to know that. And uh, so you'll end up with some time in the ward being cared for by the team in that area. Notice all the towels over everything. They don't want to see us, and they sure in heck don't want to see anybody else who might be another predator. So those towels help reduce the visual stimulation. And a bit of darkness is, you know, it's calming, keeps things a little bit more peaceful for them. But every day you're going to be pulled out, and often you get weighed, because if we don't track your weight, we often can't judge what we need to do next. And as you see, this heron was very good about it, just popped on the scales himself, and somebody took a photo. So, yeah, this is a good patient. <laughs> um, we also not only go the intravenous route, we are fortunate, and if anybody's had a cat or a dog who's got subcutaneous fluids, it's exactly the same process. We often use subcutaneous fluids to help uh, restore hydration states to our animals. And that is often given, and you can see maybe a little bit, it's just a bit yellow. We also dose it with a little bit of B group vitamins. You know, we make a cocktail up and they get all the goodies they can possibly handle while we're doing this. Hydration is probably one of the most crucial factors in trying to pull these animals back to stability. And you all know, if anybody here has ever been dehydrated, and I know none of you have done this. You know, Saturday night, you know these people, they go out on a bender, <laughs> and Sunday morning they wake up with a headache from hell, and they're dehydrated like a prune, okay? I know none of you know this, but you see. <laughs> Our animals are just the same. They come in like prunes, and so it takes time. You know, it's not till Monday morning that that person is starting to feel okay, and they have only done, you know, they've only gone out one night a couple of nights ago. These guys have maybe had hours to days of being in a really critical place. And then, of course, we get, so I would like to say, many of those animals we call the train wrecks. They never, there's that sub-adult and adult animals that come in all year round, and they've really been so profoundly damaged or hurt by whatever's going on. That, but then we get the home wrecks. These are the healthy kids that come in. And of course, there's a seasonality to what that, that happens. But we literally get hundreds upon hundreds of babies in that nursery. It is quite a sight to go in there and just see, you know, just row upon row of babies. <coughs> but it's also good to, we also collect data on every animal that comes in. So we can also chart when we're likely to see 
these animals. So this is when our squirrels come in. And you can see by far and away, August is our biggest month for squirrels. So if you're a volunteer, you don't take, and you like squirrels, you don't take your holidays in because you can have fun feeding all the babies. Um, so it's really important for us also to take that uh, time to enter data because it gives us such an edge when we start to look at what's happening with our animals and also how we plan our annual cycle. We also get all sorts of other cues in, but you know, when you start feeding them, oh, they do melt your heart. <laughs> really sweet little guys. <laughs> and even, you know, those big mouths gaping at you when you walk in. They're very, very cute. <laughs> so yellow crown night here is quite interesting. One of the primary sources of food for these guys are crabs. And we often, in, you know, our community can't get enough of the natural foods, so we sort of go to second best. And we were still having problems uh, up to a couple of years ago with our yellow crown night herons. So I rang um, a place called, what is it? Uh, it's a crab restaurant up in Fort Lauderdale. And the gentleman there, the head of the kitchen, was so kind. He said, sure, come on over, we'll give you some crabs. And we get buckets of crabs from them. And we make a, cr a crab slurry and feed that to these guys. And we actually turn them around. Their bone growth is better. They put on weight like you wouldn't believe. So because we're feeding them what biology told them they should be eating. So um, it's pretty good. This is making the crab slurry. You shove them in a blender, put a bit of water in and turn it on. Don't forget to put the lid on, of course. <laughs> Um, and believe me, we have some people who've done that. <laughs> but it's so good because in the you know, rehab, we don't always need to use all of it up. You put it in ice cube trays, freeze it down, and then you have ice cubes of crab slurry. How easy is that? <laughs> possums are one of my totally most favorite animals. Did you know mum possum actually changes her milk through the lactation to help the baby? These guys are born at 12 days of age. They started off, 12, 12 days ago, they started off as a fertilized egg. By day eight, they were still just a collection of cells. In four days, they sorry, changed over. I'm getting excited. Um, they changed over to this unbelievable small little embryo that crawls out of the first womb into the second womb. And their name is Didelphomorpha, which means two wombs. And there she, they latch onto the, to the nipple and they stay there attached till about day 60 or 70. Then they're going to get off and go and pop around a little bit, but by about day 80, they're starting to move outside and start eating other things. Now, mum changes her milk formulation, her immune function formulation, to help them meet the needs of these kids as they start to venture out. Because you know what happens to kids as soon as they go back to school and fall, don't you? They all catch colds. And this is exactly what mum is helping prevent. And so we also know that some of the components in possum milk is, or marsupial milk, is now being used to treat MRSA in humans. Can you believe it? It is so effective. It is also being used to make uh, mastitis treatments in Australia. So these are natural antibiotics from possums. So doesn't it change your mind about possums though? These yeah. things go to rock. Uh, so we do get a lot of them in, and uh, they were really cute. But I have to tell you, OMG, <laughs> is that ever cute? We had three babies, and of course they're all exactly alike. They're all from one embryo, and they all split. This is what um, uh, these guys do. So um, the armadillos that you see in the family are all exactly the same genetic pattern. And cute beyond belief. Wow. And actually, mum, mum Armadillo changes her milk through lactation because all of the scales are actually bone. And so she provides more and more minerals in her milk as lactation goes on so that these guys can grow their nice arm and coat. Anyway, so we have a lot of fun. And we, I mean, we do get so much pleasure out of seeing these little guys grow. But there comes a time where we've got to get them ready to get on with their lives. And so we start to think about next steps. Now, as you know, the world is not long in, in, uh, built in rectangles. And so we also have to think about making sure that our animals do what they're supposed to do, and maneuver around the world that they live in. And so we have friends, oh, goodness me, no, no, no. 
Let's see if we can get this to go. So we have L-shaped habitats so that you can see the birds. We can watch them maneuver around corners. And we can also see if they're fit enough to actually continue you know, getting on with uh, the process of getting fit and moving on with life. Um, this is really cool. This is a great good heron getting signed off for a lease. Look at this flight and look at the control that bird is, is showing us, maneuvering in tight spaces. This is a bird getting really close to go and then coming down, controlled landing, perfect. You feel really good about letting these things go because you know they're ready to face the world and the world is not a nice place for them a lot of the time. But these guys have as good a chance of airing. And it's getting them released. I mean, what a treat that is. You know, getting them back out there. They don't look back. Uh, of course, education is one of the things that we do. We have a lot of externs and interns coming through our facility. Um, with me on board, I'm trying to do every week, we do different educational topics and lectures. I try not to bore people too much, but you know, we try and cover a lot of topics, but we're also doing more and more out outreach. We're speaking at conferences all over the place and trying to not only learn ourselves, but share what we learn. And it's pretty exciting. Um, one of the things that brings it all together that we also, one of the messages that we're trying to get out there, of course, is to reduce injuries. So we have these wonderful tubes that are fitted on all the piers in the Fort Lauderdale area where you can shove your fishing line, that, you know, your waste pieces of fishing line and, and damaged hooks so that they don't get left flying around um, for the uh, birds to get, you know, get tangled up in. So there's a lot of things that we are doing on an educational level that aren't, aren't directly applied to the individual animals but more to help prevent them ever becoming patients of ours. So I wanted to show you a few cases. This is what happens when a fish hook gets caught in the pouch area and there's fishing line and it gets caught in trees. And so you get further, you know, more and more tears in the pouch. And it's a case of just every week or two or three, you're going to open that, you put them under anesthetic, debride all of those open areas, stitch them back up. And it took several surgeries to get this bird's pouch back up. So it's a bit blurry, but you can see this is a pelican with its pouch fully restored and ready to get on the line. Um, did you notice that we have a finger between this? <laughs> yep. This is because they don't have external nostrils. And that's a, a feature of some of the pelicaniformes, uh, so pelicans and also gannets are the same. So don't resist the urge to grab them and close their beak, okay? They may become very um, um, quiet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, here's another one. How many hooks can you see in this picture? There's quite a few, isn't there? So we can start, here's one up here, one down here, one here, a bunch of them here, one here. That's what we see coming in so often, and I'm sure you see them coming in here constantly as well. So it can be really a big problem, but one of the things you can do with these, if it's easy, you don't have to do surgery, if it's easy to get in there, what you can do is actually, you know, guilt the person with the smallest hands on site to go in. So the animal's under, the bird's under deep anesthesia and you reach down and there's all sorts of worms and all creepy crawlies down that throat. It is really disgusting. It smells really bad. And you go hunting for hooks. And there she is, she's in there feeding around and you've got to find them and then you've got to back them out and you're manipulating them and pulling them into your hand so that when you pull your hand out, you don't re-snag the bird. And this goes on way too often. You know, they're having to pull hooks out of these animals. Who was the first to do that? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I, will, I will say that Laura Quinn here Started our Robert Center here. I watched her do this. Yes. Right? So this is something that. Show me your hands, girls. Give me, give me a hand. I have large hands. Sorry. Who's got the smallest hands? You are the pelican. We have interns. We have 
Oh, oh. Ik ben Vega. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very rewarding, and you can see it's not fast as you're getting in there and trying to unhook these things. There's another way. Sometimes, if you're in a bit, you can't get your hand into. You can actually run a rubber hose. And so you thread the. Um, this is why you never cut the um, line. line off, because you can thread a rubber hose down that line. Is that? down to the hook and you can actually bank it out that way just by using uh, a piece of rubber hose that, that, which helps stop you having to go in surgically and remove it. What but, uh, there we go and we have success. What percentage of, of, what percentage of birds or animals uh, make it to the re-release re of animals? That's a great question. Now it, it really depends on the classification. I, I am trying to prepare a manuscript at the moment called the Rex of Rehab. So the Storm Rex, post Irma for instance, probably about 50% of those animals will be okay for release. The Home Rex, that's the babies, the healthy babies come in, 85 to 95% of those should be able to go out again. The Train Rex, I would think maybe only 20%. And uh, you know we we we're facing so much difficulty with those animals. They come in in such grievous shape. And of course, the next thing after you've got all the hooks out, you've got to make sure they're all fine. And so everybody gets fed and is happy and comes in and has their stuff. Well, we've got a lovely pelican pool which also um, houses in on well, here. Yeah. Out of my way, um, <laughs> the, the cormorants and, and hingas as well. And you know, this is a nice place to be because you just get it hook free to live it. I mean, <laughs> what's not so like? <laughs> so, really fun to watch. And you know, it just gives you so much pleasure when you see these animals actually moving on the stage. These guys are fairly robust. There's a lot of animals that never become quite as robust. And if you think of some of the other fish eaters, like the osprey, they can be really problematic to get self-feeding. One of the tricks we can use is to put a fake nest in there. Because remember when they were youngsters, mum and dad would bring fish back to the nest. And so that's the first time in their lives that they'd be eating dead fish. And what are we presenting them? Dead fish, because you know ours are all freezer fish. Uh, so this way you're actually have, you know, taking them back to being a, a, a youngster. So by just feeding them on a small platform, sometimes you can get them eating. We have all sorts of tricks in play here. Um, the, the biggest gift we all get is this. Is that day when you have a whole bunch of them that you can actually let go. And they do what they should do. They get on and, you know, take off and start to get on with their lives again. That is magic. Oh, I'm sure they're very social when they're here, so I'm sure they do stay. And you know, um, I think there's probably a fair bit of recognition of each other as well. Especially, um, you know, if you've been together for a while, I'm sure there's a lot of recognition. We, we've always thought, well, we've always thought birds are a bit thick, but they're really not. You know, there's a lot more going on there than you really ever give credit for. Uh, I think, or we've ever given credit to. Them. Yes. Do you ban these birds? No, we don't, sadly. Um, I used to. Um, so that's why I'm very confident that rehabilitation is a really good feature, you know, a good thing, and it works. Um, I was banding birds right from the mid-80s through to the uh, 90s up in Montreal at Le Nichoir, the bird rehab centre I started up there. We got one man return once from a robin that was two years old and killed on the road in South Carolina. That meant, and it came in as a nestling. It survived and migrated. Uh, we have band returns from ring-billed gulls that were kicked off a roof up in Montreal, hand read by us, and it was sighted down here in Florida. You know, just incredible. Uh, mallard ducks are migrating and shot now, sadly, uh, on migration. Um, crows, the American crows, we have bands coming in five and six years later after banning them. You know, so we know it works if you do a good job, and I, you know, I think that's another thing that so many of us in this business, we are absolutely, um, we we bought into the fact that we've got to be professionals about this, and you know, there's ways of doing it, and we can do it professionally. 
Um, Nick, the last case I wanted to talk about before I go on to just a slight other thing I'm doing with now is the turtle. Did you know there are two papers in the scientific literature where they document people crossing lines of traffic to go and hit the turtle? Can you believe it? What the hell has that turtle ever done to you? You know, and so we get them in. Can you see all the hardware just needed to pull all the fractures together? This is what this is all about. We, we put them under deep anesthesia, use stainless steel screws into the carapace, and then wire them together. So we are fixing, doing the <coughs> external fixators for these turtles. And that's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And you know that bird that healed in you know, two, three weeks? This is like two, three months, <laughs> a year. <laughs> these guys are not fast. They're going to take their time. And we give them the time. And I think that's one of the gifts. Sadly, one of the biggest forms of mortality in the turtles will be the females crossing roads to go lay eggs. So it's even important to pick up a seemingly dead turtle. Within 48 hours, we'll go down here, they're probably cooked before that, but up north, 48 hours, you can still harvest those eggs and go and bury them in a normal nest, and then hopefully it's not a complete dead loss. Now, one of the things that happens is we have all these neat things going on, but more and more we're starting to integrate biology into what we do, understanding what the animal is telling us. And one of the greatest gifts we have here in North America is a series called The Birds of North America. It's housed at Cornell University, and if you're a member of you know, birding societies or whatever, you often have free membership to go and have a look at this. These are you know, maybe a hundred pages of biological data on these birds. And so you, we as rehabbers benefit so much. So um, I've been presenting a number of, at a number of conferences, taking a lot of this information and translating it into usable things for us as rehab. So I just want to share one with you at this stage on the great egret, since it seems to be a bird that we use a lot in, in literature and what have you down here. And so there's the page on the great egret in the Birds of North America series. If you're a birder, it's an incredible resource. In Quebec, of course, we have the Breeding Bird Atlas as well, which is brilliant and gives us so much information. So, you know, these, these things can teach us so much and um, help us as rehab. So if we look at what we, we can learn, we know um, the great white egret or uh, the greater egret, its home range. And of course, we're right bang smack in the middle of uh, where it lives and often spends its year-round lives. I just saw a few on the way here this afternoon. And of course, they do have areas where they pop up to and go and breed because the snow's gone and things are good. Um, we also know that it has a number of different names. And these things are often important when you're talking to that caller who's calling you, you know, you're trying to find out what the heck bird we're talking about. Well, knowing the common names can be really important to some. So we have Adia Elba. I have that there. Now, one of the cool things that um, the, they've compiled is also this uh, graphic, which tells us when the molt is happening, of course, when breeding and migration is happening. Well, for us as rehabbers, we often get birds in that have lost feathers. And it's really useful to know when we're likely to see those feathers molt back in. It gives us a heads up of how long we may have to keep them or if we have to make other arrangements. The other thing you have to remember too is sometimes they come in with these really funny colours and they're not sick. You know, he's not green with illness. He's actually in this breeding blue colours. And so sometimes rehabbers, you know, often we often start off because, well, we picked up a little bird on the road and all of a sudden we're, we're caught. We're, we're entranced. We want to do this. And you start getting more and more animals in, and you never have time to do the research yourself. And so this is what I'm trying to do a lot of the time, is bring a lot of this in. So when you get a green face in, it's not sick. It's actually in breeding in colour and ready to make babies. And we also know a lot about where the habitats are, fresh and salt water wetlands. I mean, obviously down in this region, we've got it all, don't we? This is prime habitat. Usually, they nest over trees on islands or over water, but what, and they're also um, colonial nesters with other species of herons. 
That tells us that if we get a baby in, we can shove them in with another baby of another heron species because they do that naturally in the wild. Helps us. Now, if it's a solitary nester, you probably won't mix it. But sometimes it's really good to have a buddy. You know, misery loves company. <laughs> and the other thing to note is they're also moving on to human constructions more and more. For a re from a rehab perspective, that means maybe more babies coming in because people decide, oh my God, I don't want it there. I've got to take that building down and I have to do it now. You have to take babies. You know, what are you going to do? Because you know darn well that you know, they're likely to just toss them out or make a fake nest somewhere else that is totally inappropriate. So often we get involved with actions that we choose not to. Of course, the first thing you do is ring your local fish and wild, fisheries office or you know, your, your, your whatever offices you have in your region to either get permission for something to happen and so that you can be doing everything legally as well. But it does mean that you know, as soon as you see human habitations being utilized, you know darn well we're going to see more of them coming in. Now, when we start to look at the development of these chicks, I like to know how old are they and what is the normal developmental stages that we should see linked to those days. And it gives us a clue over here what we should be doing at that stage. Now, the, other thing, the reason this is so crucial is these animals are also eating a lot of toxic material that change their development. And often you will see animals that are contaminated with various pesticides or other heavy metals or something they will develop apparently normally for a little bit and then they crash. And if you know what should be normal and you start to see this crash, we can often you know, make a decision either to euthanize because there's nothing we can do about it. Um, but it also tells you you need to document because if you see a whole lot of things coming in from one area, this is important. One of the things that I could not believe here is that we get anophthalmia or microophthalmia either no eyes or little eyes coming in in many species. Possums, um, boat tail grackles. What is the other one we see? Uh, you know, those are the two major ones. We shouldn't see that. That's a developmental issue we should never ever see. And yet we see it on a routine basis in, in South Florida. That is a bit frightening. In the human literature, we do know from reports for human birds is that we see that as well, and that Florida actually has a high level of that in human birds. It's something like 120 birds per 10,000 have either anophthalmia or microophthalmia. Most of the time, anophthalmia is also linked to so many other developmental issues that maybe will not be born, and not be born alive anyway. So we're seeing these things coming in, and it's also something that as rehab is we need to understand and document every time. Because there may be hot spots, there may be a point source of a contaminant that only we can put a hand finger on because we're the ones in the front line seeing all these things coming in. Now the other thing is, notice here, these are great egrets. These are pretty common birds around the world, but we haven't got one weight measure for these babies. But what we do have is this really cool little calculation. So we can take the age and days and the Coleman link with this calculation, we can start to plug in what we know and actually get a wait in days, which is handy for us to know as rehabbers because we'll know where we should be on this developmental chart, but also we can take a wait and start to fill in and populate those charts for us as rehabbers. So we're starting to use a lot of things out there to help make our jobs easier, but also to know whether we're winning or losing with these various cases. And I think they're totally cool birds. Um, and of course, what do they eat? They're very opportunistic. In fact, they eat, they eat a whole a lot of stuff. So what does that tell us as rehabs that we need to think about in our diets? Know your local areas, that often helps as well. But they certainly eat a heck of a lot of different things. And we certainly know Florida offers them a very nice big smorgasbord. One of the biggies we get is this. This is a, a parasite called uh, Eustrongoloides, and we see it. This is a necropsy I did just a few months ago, and uh, these parasites are killing off a number of our birds. But from a rehab perspective, we need to also be treating as soon as these animals come into care, because we know it's there. 
They also get, um, actually, isn't it incredible? Over in Japan, they actually found one with a chondrosarcoma, so a tumor of, of the uh, connective tissue. Um, Eastern equine encephalitis has been found in these things. It's crazy what goes on out there. And of course, they do suffer from stress myopathy. We used to call that catch myopathy. I hate that. It's stress myopathy. These animals have been under so much stress. You can imagine what they're going through. You know if you walk upstairs too fast and you get that burning in the front of your legs? That means your cells have changed into anaerobic respiration and creating a lot of lactic acid. And it's, it, it burns. These birds, whatever puts them into stress, changes their whole body into anaerobic respiration. So their whole body is flooded with lactic acid. From a rehab perspective, we've got a lot of damage control to do for that bird to help it get through. Yeah. How much do you see of uh, ingestion of plastics and things like that? Oh, they're there. Um, it, the, one of the gifts that we have at the Cape is that uh, at um, South Florida, said, I'm there and I do most of the necropsies. Uh, so I'm opening things up and constantly finding things. That, uh, the last wood store we opened it actually had rubber bands. You know those big rubber bands that you see around uh, broccoli? It had two of those in it in its stomach. Um, other things. But I'm seeing plastics, I'm seeing all sorts of things in those things. In those baby in their GIs. So what it means is we we feed a lot of really high quality fish. We add vitamin E because our fish are frozen. And every time you freeze fish, it loses vitamin E. And so we need to add it to its diet. We also add thiamine. Thiamine is a B1. It's an enzyme, it's metabolized, it's eaten up right, an enzyme in the fish. And if you end up with a B1 deficiency, you, you're probably not going to be very robust for very long. So we add it, we know that this needs and also, um, we're going to treat those nematodes with some ivermectin and to just counteract the stress myopathy, we'll give lots of fluids, we'll use vitamin E and some selenium, and maybe even give them a muscle relaxant because it hurts and we want them to get moving, we want them to feel better. I mean, you know yourself, if you're really in bad shape and you're feeling miserable, you know, certain genders of people who we will not name who get a cold and just dying in bed. <laughs> um, you know, give them a lot of aspirin, you feel better. Well, it's the same principle. We make them feel better by giving them a muscle relaxant with all the fluids on board. So we have, you know, we have a lot of things in our toolbox now to use for these animals. Anyway, so um, that's about it. And, um, you know, just as my dear colleagues down here, they would have the same list, I'm sure. But if you can, have a look at us on Facebook, you know, um, any of the materials that we can share with you, we are so happy to do so. Um, you know, obviously you have some wonderful volunteers, you've been telling me about them, that's brilliant. And, you know, we're always looking at ways and that we can bring those do donor dollars in and, um, you know, make friends with everybody out there, out there in our community so that they know and they feel comfortable turning to us for any reason. You know, I want to thank you so much for coming out tonight. It's been so much share, you know, it's been fun for me sharing a little bit of what we do. And I, you know, any questions you have, anyone want to talk about anything, that's great. Thank you.